Hello, I'm Thomas Hare, Chief Content Officer of the Performance Driven Marketing Institute, a not-for-profit trade association that serves companies in the performance and direct-to-consumer marketing world. Happy New Year, and welcome to the latest episode of Take 20, created by the PDMI's Brand Response Council. These 20-minute live conversations featuring leaders in the performance marketing world speaking about the hottest topics in the industry are scheduled twice a month. Before we get to today's conversation, a quick housekeeping note. We'll be addressing any questions from the audience at the end of, day's, of the session today, but you don't have to wait to ask them. Utilize the questions tab on your control panel to type and send your question in. We'll be collecting them and we'll try to get to as many as possible in the final moments of this episode. Today's episode, the intersection of connected TV hardware and media, was prompted by Brand Response Council conversations about how companies like Samsung, Vizio, and Roku are embedding new media and shopping technologies into their devices. With hundreds of millions of connected TVs now in the marketing market, that technology is bringing new ways for media companies and brands to leverage the actual hardware to deliver advertising and shopping experiences. Today, we're excited to welcome Apex Media's Doug Bogner, a longtime Brand Response Council member who's been touting hardware's role in the future of TV media for about as long as I can remember. And Blockboard's James Shears, whose past experience already includes working in partnership with companies like Vizio, but also includes a stint at Roku. As always, PDMI Brand Response Council Chair Chris Foster of Modern Postcard is here to seek the best answers for you, our loyal viewers. Welcome, Chris. Welcome, team. Take it away. Thank you so much, Thomas, and welcome in, everybody. Happy New Year. Welcome to Season 3 of Take 20. This is wonderful. This is episode number 57. Uh, anyone who's uh, familiar with Heinz and their products, 57 Sauce has a fantastic old product that used to that I grew up with in Pittsburgh. Um, but anyway, welcome to Season 3, everybody. We're very excited about the new slate of content and episodes that we have for this year. And we're going to start off, like Thomas said, about the intersection of hardware advances and media. The questions that we really want to start probing into now are, what is the future of shoppable TV? It's been around for a while as a buzzword, but is the technology now catching up? And are the consumer habits going to adopt this new technology? Will new devices embed the changing media landscape into actual hardware and software? Will T-commerce or television commerce now become a normal part of our buying habits? Does this tech tie into G-commerce, which is game commerce, with new gaming devices as well? G-commerce is actually up and running and is out and is part of now the fabric for some people's media landscape. And the question is, does T-commerce or shoppable device commerce or D-commerce actually become something we talk about? So. Um, Doug, I'm going to start with you, and, and if you want to show everybody your shirt, which would be awesome, because you started back in the Wayback Machine. Look at that. I freaking love it. Shoppable media. Yeah, this is obviously not a new concept. Uh, this shirt is from 2015, and it was the sixth annual Shoppable TV Summit that was put on by a delivery agent, my uh, departed company, but um, so this isn't new, right? This is mm -hmm. something that we've all been trying to figure out for a long time, and several companies, and maybe a couple I've been associated with, have gone bankrupt trying to figure it out. But yeah. I think we're closer than ever. And you made a really key point there, Chris, in in my opinion, that gaming commerce is leading the way. It mm -hmm. is, you know, that 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 environment exists. It's robust. It's incredible, and little known to most people who aren't deeply involved in the in the gaming world. So yeah, we're making, uh, I think there are finally real strides uh, on the front of making television shoppable to the average consumer. All right, so um, Doug, I'm gonna stick with you and I wanna lean into that a little bit. We, we heard that Roku is manufacturing their own TVs and you know they are part of the TV universe. It's a quote unquote Roku TV, even though they not, might not have been the ones making it. From a business side, that integration seems to make sense. But I guess the question that I ask you is, what's different now than it was four, five, seven years ago? Um, there's there's several things that are different. Technology has improved to the point, and people's ad adaptation and, and familiarity with that that technology has has um, improved to the point where it's actionable. You can engage with them. Uh, Roku's move into the space, and James knows this better than I do, is all about operating systems. Television operating systems are going to rule the world and they're going to control your media hub. I just recently 
last week bought a Samsung television and I'm blown away by the ability to engage, the ability to link my Alexa to it, to use my telephone, my mobile device as, uh, as a remote and to guess what? Buy stuff. Of course. Uh, so James, I guess I'm going to ask you this too. Um, as you see the technology and the hardware become better, are there things like a universal remote? Are there things like a technology device that's going to kind of link and connect all the devices within a home using the TV as a hub? Um, that's an interesting question and I would actually um, go back to what Douglas was saying. You know, the interesting thing about the operating systems right now is everybody's trying to push their own remote with different bells and whistles. Some of it's voice activated, some of it's not. But really what they're trying to do is create an ecosystem that's less, less frictionless. Like part of what we need to think about as, uh, as an industry is really about really what would stop anything from being successful is friction, right? So we need to figure out ways that we can make things less friction. That may not be a remote, it might be Alexa, it might be Google, it might be any kind of voice activated stuff. Or it might be ways to actually think about utilizing your phone differently than we do today, right? Like part of what a lot of them are trying to do is they're trying to take a minimalist approach to the remote. So sometimes the remotes are a little, a little harder to think through clickable. And that's why they're trying to push their apps to the remote. And uh, I'm sorry, to the, to the to mobile the phone. And part of the reason they do that is because it's easier to think about transactions on your phone than it is on your TV. Sure. Well, one thing that I've seen too is, um, in the automobile industry, for example, instead of a proprietary entertainment system, which a lot of them do, but now a lot of new cars are also adopting AirPlay. They're like, look, we're never gonna keep up with the phones. The phones are always gonna be faster to deploy than we are. It takes us years to put a car together, but they're gonna be new phones. So let's just connect to the phone because that's just easiest and via apps and the like. Do you think that that's probably a path forward for some of this to where just an app connected device suddenly gets you connected to your TV and then connected to either different apps or shopping environments? I think so, although it's it's still about it's still about the ecosystem and infrastructure, right? So if you think about somebody like Amazon, the reason Amazon is likely going to be successful in this arena, and they've started they started testing in 2021 on some of their shows, they've started to do more in 2022. It's it's really about their entire delivery system, right? Like they know who you are, they have your um, your credit card information, they're able to, you know, one-stop shop sort of thing and actually transact and deliver something to you. Everyone else will require some kind of partnership on the fulfillment side, right? So if you think about Roku, one interesting, that Ro interesting thing Roku did this past year was they went down the partnership road. So they partnered with Walmart and they're using Walmart as delivery system or mechanism. And so I think it's really important to think about ways that you can sort of triangulate the entire ecosystem, which is really important for, for all of that stuff. And then the other big thing is, I'm, I apologize, but I'm, I'm going to overuse friction here, but it's really about the friction of the actual transaction. So another reason uh, is really the, the payment stuff, right? So if we go back to the, the remote, let's say, I mean, if, if you've ever tried to, on a smart TV, put in your email address or sign something up, right? It, it takes a long time. Terrible. If you have a credit card, that that's a that's a huge Disaster. thing, right? So if, if you have to put that in and then, um, you know, take away from the experience of actually viewing something, it gets cumbersome. So things like Roku, they have Roku Pay, Samsung has something similar, right? So if, if you are able to capture the payment on the front end to make things a little more seamless, it's mm -hmm. really important to think about everything a little more holistically. Sure. And I think that what you had mentioned before about, I love the idea of, you know, linking those bank cards, linking the, the financial piece of it. Um, but I would think that Amazon naturally has the, the cleanest path forward. They, they are completely now a vertically integrated company where they develop the content, they have the distribution, they've got the devices, they have the product to shop and the shopping network. They also have the finance because you just put it on your Amazon account and it's done. And then they also have the voice activation too if needed. So I'm thinking that that's the easiest way, but I guess Doug, I'll, I'll, I'll go back, um, you know, when we talked about what's different now, 
people are kind of different, but they're also, we're also the same. There's certain things we trust or don't trust. And even though the technology will make it easier, do you think we still as consumers have an appetite for blending content experience with a commercial action? Absolutely, no, uh, no question about it. But there's a key component here. The interaction needs to be both seamless and seamless and contextual. Um, people do not, they, they're watching their television for entertainment, educational purposes. Well, does that happen in America? No, education is probably not what they're watching it for. Um, so anyway, they're being entertained. They do not want to be interrupted and be relentlessly marketed to. However, mm -hmm. and there's a, by the way, for nerds like me on this topic, there's a great AWS media blog post from September about this, and it is step-by-step step how you sell uh, someone who's watching a, a live sporting event a jersey from one of the players. From it, it, it's, it's fantastic. So if it's in context, and this can be done using ACR, automatic content recognition technology, um, which we had back in this day, by the way, but we didn't have the transaction part. So I'm going to jump back to what James just said, the transaction, who owns the transaction, who has the data, and inputting with a remote is brain damage. Um, but we've progressed beyond that point now with the subscription services available to us and things like Apple Pay, but Apple Pay is kind of a different animal. I won't even open up that Pandora's box. But yes, the answer to your question is, if it is seamless and if it is contextual, uh, consumers will engage and they will per purchase uh, within a program. You know what, I'm curious because I can imagine um, if it's as easy as, let's say you're, if there's a jersey or there's a new jersey and, um, or s some kind of product where it's a clear product promotion or product endorsement, and I'm looking at my device and I just say, Alexa, I don't want to say it because she's behind me, but <laughs> um, uh, buy that jersey. Right. If it's voice activated, if that's if that's it, and you're in the program itself, so it doesn't distract you or deviate you from actually watching it, I could actually see that working. Absolutely. And do you remember the little buy buttons that um, Amazon used to have? The one of them said "tied," and you stuck it next to your washing machine, and one of them said. Um, um, Lysol and you stuck into the bathroom or whatever and we were when you were out you just push that and it was connected and all of a sudden the next day or that afternoon that product shows up at your house it's not too far away from that to be honest with you very very targeted um, and to overuse James word completely frictionless mm -hmm. so I want that boom Sure. So, so James, I, I guess my question for you is, because um, you've got some younger children that are moving in and kind of experiencing is they they are going to watch their parents be consumers and they too will adopt consumer patterns. Do you think that they are going to be learning this way of shopping? Do you think that this is a possibility, Not maybe not f for the now, but definitely five or 10 years from now? Well, definitely not for the now. We're gonna we're gonna put some uh, parameters on <laughs> stopping people from being able to buy. But uh, for you. yeah, I mean, I, I I think that the important thing from from the way that the way that I think about stuff is shoppable TV really needs to be thought of as more of an evolutionary process, right? Like I think what's in, it's not going to be zero to sixty, and that's sort of obvious given. Sorry, Doug, the the T-shirt. T-shirt, but. but <laughs> So I, I, I do think as, as long as people are thinking about it in that way, I, I do think there will be a time when it uh, when it gets to a stage that you, you will be able to transact. I think the interesting thing is, um, you know, the, the one the jersey is, is one thing, right? Like it's, it's contextually relevant where I think the what needs to happen is we need to also evolve thinking about how we actually deliver ads. And so when I say that, you still need to think about the targeted experience, but then also need to think about the format itself. Do we need to think about sequential messaging, right? Like, do you need to still tell stories differently? Do we need to think about this differently than than on broadcast, right? Like, does it have to be a 30 second commercial or can you do like little blips and, and really try to try to drop people's attention? Because when I think about my children, they have no attention span, right? So for them to for them to sit through some of that stuff, I think is going to be tricky. So if if the question is, will the younger folks start to 
start to buy? I think the answer is yes, but I think it has to be done in a way that makes more sense to them. And I don't think that's going to be the same way that that we all for us. With, with no, I, 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 so. that's 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 where I was going with it. I think that there's there's a you know if the technology is ready, let's say by 2025, there's an entire group of shoppers who are you know of a certain age that has to learn how to do this and you have to learn how to advertise to them. Whereas in 10 or 15 years from now, you'll have shoppers that have grown up with this new shopping experience. So um, Generation Alpha right now is growing up watching people buy things on their phones. A decade ago, that was unheard of, yep. but now it's normal. All right, yep. so they're gonna have a new normal as they move in and their their consumer patterns are gonna follow, I think something a completely different approach than ours. I also think, um, James and, and Doug, that the, the products would be different, right? I can't imagine someone shopping for a car on TV and buying one, a Ford F-150, after they see an ad. <laughs> Not right now, but I think, uh, Chris, uh, and we're, we're still in sort of these, we're in the 10th year of our baby steps, or 12th year of our baby steps for this. <laughs> this is uh, crawl base, as always. Yeah, yeah, right. But I think that's why uh, the transactional concept and really choppable TV will be at least supported initially by tentpole events. And okay. right now, that's live sports. Right. There is nothing that aggregates viewership uh, better than live sports at, at this time. There, you know, the advanced feature capability of, of, of uh, cable operators is okay. They could pull that off. Um, broadcast television. Eh, maybe not so much, but we've got this thing called Next Gen TV that's coming online very quickly, far more quickly than I anticipated, honestly, which will provide some interactivity and a deeper level in engagement with consumers. So that's that's an opportunity. Um, but it's still these big events, again, where you have these mass crowds and you're, you know, for Team A or Team B, where you're probably going to see the real, um, at least first big steps in terms of shopping so to that I point I, go uh, ahead so, sorry i sorry i just wanted to add one thing i i think that's right i think that the thing that still needs to happen though is is the experience right because i i do agree that it, it's it's still likely more it, it's more likely to happen in a sporting event but even if you think about think about like the flow of a game right if there's if the game is highly engaging and the score is in doubt and you know like you're trying to be engaged are you going to take time out of the game to go to something to actually transact if it's seamless that's a different story if it's you know the click of a button like it could be for an amazon i think that's different but if it's the, the the experience itself really needs to flow properly otherwise even even when you're getting people and super engaged i think you're going to lose them because it's going to be hard to hard to come back well, yeah well, and that, the one go ahead that that goes back to your 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 point james about the format of the ads themselves yep and you know we did a lot of testing back in these days and you cannot I, I, and, and i'm surprised by this the roku approach with walmart right now is to pause the program uh in order to transact clunky we did that yep. in 2010 it doesn't work it's not it that's not going to work so you know, do you I, shrink the screen do you overlay i mean listen yep. uh, that's tight you know where i can Walmart, see if, call me right where I, can <laughs> see, where I could see a fit though is um actually in national football league broadcasts the one thing about national football league it's tailor-made for television because there's so many blocks and breaks and stops and starts, right? There's so many stops and starts where they insert advertising. I could actually see something where through NFL, these advertising blocks th that are naturally part of the game anyway, mm -hmm. have an advertisement yeah. that facilitates a transaction while that ad is happening. Um, so I could see things where it's as an interesting test, that's where you could do it, where you have these games, to your point, James, where it doesn't interrupt the flow of the game. And you're right, Doug, sh shifting screens and moving, th that's terrible. But if I'm in an ad and I see an ad for a product, even if it's more of a consumable product, maybe it's you know uh, from the Gap or maybe it's a jeans or something like that, where it's it's 
easy. I understand it. It's not too expensive. I can do an impulse buy because I was thinking about it anyway. I'm actually in the ad right now. And, it, and then I complete my purchase seamlessly. And then suddenly the game is back on and I just, I just shop for something I never knew I always wanted. <laughs> Chris, even think about um, the NBA or college basketball affecting the rules of the sport. And I may be way off in the weeds here, but telev excuse me, t the timeout structure and the rules associated with timeouts in, in basketball are driven by TV. They even yes. call them TV timeouts. They so do. They are, you know, that is baked in. That is right. So, in. and then the network gets a smidgen of the sale that happens because they put that in. So it's it's a very interesting to your, to your earliest point, James, about the ecosystem making it easy for the consumer to buy in the moment without interrupting their content flow. Um, I think that that's something that very smarter people than myself will be figuring out. Hey, we are at 11:22. We are ready for questions. Again, these things go so fast because you guys are yeah. so smart. So, um, Thomas, we have some questions from the audience. We sure do. Um, got a few, few, few solid ones here. Um, does anyone on the panel know who the leading device companies are in gaming commerce? And do you know if the advertising on these devices are generally from brand or from direct consumer marketers? That's a great, that's a great, great question. I don't know the answer, but that doesn't, won't stop me from taking a guess. <laughs> and um, the answer would be Microsoft, and it would be directed consumer. I, I also, I, I don't know for sure either, but I think it does depend on this is sort of a cop out, but it depends on your definition of gaming, right? Because um, Samsung has different gaming that's linked to the TV that has different advertising than it would in a in an actual game. So I, I think there are just depends on how you triangulate that. Um, for the Samsung stuff, it's a little more brand oriented, but still still sort of D2C, D2TC. Wow, direct to consumer. So just say there that. you go. There we go. <laughs> um, just one that popped in, and uh, Doug, if you can send this over. Can you share a link to the Amazon post about selling shirts to someone yeah. watching us? If you can yeah. send that uh, in, um, then we can uh, send the response out directly to uh, the, the uh, attendees. And we'll also <clears throat> put that link in our YouTube video of the session as well. Yeah, absolutely. Sure. I'll do that. Um, this one, uh, someone wants to get right down to brass tacks. Where are the best opportunities right now for D2C marketers to test with this type of technology? Oh, I'm diving under my desk on that one. <laughs> I, well, I'll, I'll go. I, I think it uh, I think it depends on what you're looking to accomplish. So we talked a lot about the device manufacturers. There are also folks on the publisher side, right? Like NBC has their own commerce platform, which is, admittedly more QR driven. Um, so it might be more informational, but it still allows you to transact somewhat. Um, so if you're looking to get some learnings there, that that's one option. Um, you know, Amazon is still in the learning phases and Roku are still in the learning phases, but you know, Roku is making a little more noise than anyone else. So that might be an opportunity to, to get some learnings. Uh, but I think as Amazon, as Chris was talking about, you know, with their original programming, that's really where they're seeding a lot of their um, a, a lot of their testing. So it might be an opportunity to get closer with those guys there too. Could it also be with the uh, heritage uh, cable operators too? I mean, they're, they're, they have never really developed the advanced features that are capable in a set top box. However, the, the potential exists and they may have reached the point where it makes sense to them. It is a revenue stream that provides um, maybe a, a lift that makes it worthwhile. I think also to James, your point earlier about QR codes, um, we, we're, everyone in this call and the PDMI is friendly with the folks at Flowcode, and we know that they've got some interesting QR applications on television commercials or on TV, and it doesn't matter if it's cable or streaming or linear, um, but testing the, the act of shopping while you've got the television, right? Make sure, hey, get your phone out. We've got this blah, blah, blah. Scan this QR code right now and get to the shopping page to buy, right? I mean, that's to me an interesting choice because the device is there. 
it's an easy device it's an easy frictionless action to scan that and get to the get to the purchasing page and that um especially if you're a brand who's doing this starts training your customer base that that's what you can do right and it's some of the the habit building that um also has to be a part of it as well uh, that's a really and interesting the, point yeah the, the only other thing i would add to is i think it's really really important that sometimes when people talk about clickable and, and shoppable TV, they sometimes forget about the actual campaign mechanics, right? So you still need to make sure that you understand how you're segmenting your audience, what you're looking to drive them to do. So it's really, really important that you don't get lost in, in the test. And sometimes sometimes the folks that are trying to run the test are trying to make it, they're trying to game the system a little bit. So you just need to make sure that you're having the correct conversations about, I'm trying to hit this specific target. This is what I'm looking to accomplish. So make sure you have those conversations before you actually move forward. Great, great, great. Time for one more here. Um, does the technology embedded in these devices make linear TV shoppable or does it only work with streaming media? Uh, linear can, can be absolutely shoppable. Um, you know, again, we did it in, in those days. So yeah, it, it's not restricted by, let's say the, pla the delivery platform. It's, it's available across all platforms. I'm going to rejoin you guys here and wrap this up. Thank you, uh, Chris, for another great job hosting. Uh, and thank you, James, Doug, for joining us. Uh, really appreciate your wisdom and your willingness to share it with, uh, with all of our attendees. Um, for our attendees, your next scheduled opportunity to attend a live online Take 20 episode is Wednesday, January 25th, the first of a two-part series on data automation. This episode focusing on how it's playing a role in the buying and selling of performance media. Please visit the pdmi.com slash take-20 to register for the webinar and check out the upcoming schedule. In addition, registration and hotel reservations are open for PDMI East, our next in-person event set for March 20th through 22nd at Eden Rock, Miami Beach. We're in the midst of announcing the event's big networking parties. Keep an eye on your email tomorrow for that. And educational session information is also coming soon. Visit the pdmi.com slash pdmi-east for more information and to grab your badge today. Thank you again for checking out this episode of the Take 20. We appreciate it. We'll see you soon. Take care. Thank you. Be well. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks.